Sig TV. I'm Vanessa Collette, and I'm here with Rick Rule, the chairman of Sprout U.S. Holdings. Great to see you again, Rick. Nice to be with you, Vanessa. Now, Rick, let's talk about capitulation. We've seen a lot of carnage in the industry, in this sector, um, in the last several years, but what is it really going to take for this, you know, these zombie companies, you know, the, that last 20% of companies to just throw in the towel? I don't know the answer to that, Vanessa. I'm, we talked about this last year, and I would have suspected by now that, uh, if you will, economic Darwinism would have worked. But the truth is they're sort of like cockroaches. You can't kill them. Uh, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, it needs to happen. You know this and I know this. There's mm -hmm. probably a thousand companies around the world that have no reason to exist, and they consume a million or two a year in GNA. Right. And that means that one or two billion dollars a year leaks out of the inf leaks out of the exploration industry to no useful purpose. It would be lovely for this to happen. How do we cause it to occur? I guess as investors, we just say no. Right, and is this just only a product of efficient markets? You know, can, can markets really ever be that efficient? Or is it just a pipe dream for these companies to, to I, all I, I suspect I suspect that ultimately the markets will be efficient. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that uh, despite the fact that gold has dashed investors' dreams many times, the expectations for gold investment were set, at least for my generation, in the decade of the 1970s, when the gold price went from $35 to $850 an ounce. Right. And the truth is that once a decade, gold and gold stocks put in such spectacular performance that people tolerate six or seven years of extraordinarily poor performance. And investors don't do a good enough job segregating between companies that purport to look for gold and companies that do a good job of finding and producing gold. Right. We're hoping through things like this conference to educate investors well enough that they, in movie parlance, can segregate between the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right, absolutely. That's your mission with the show. And um, I want to talk about something that you mentioned on the webinar that we recently did, and that was about how uh, 2000 and today have a lot of similarities. And I think you mentioned that um, during that time, the price of gold was in a bull market globally, just like it is now, in every currency but the U.S. dollar. So is that the only similarity? Are there others? No, there are other similarities. Um, the most important similarity, I guess, uh, was more across commodity lines in that the decade that preceded 2000, the decade of the 1990s, was a decade where many commodities were priced below their cost of production. Uh, we've talked before about the fact that bear markets end two ways. They end with either demand creation, where the price of commodities goes up enough that the companies can earn their cost of capital, mm -hmm. or more perniciously through supply destruction. Right. With supply destruction, the recovery takes longer, but it's much more violent. Right. And you'll remember, beginning in 2002, that the recovery that we saw in commodity prices was very violent because we destroyed productive capacity. As demand returned, the industry couldn't supply product. And right. what we're going through right now in commodities like copper, like coal, like oil and gas, is the beginnings of supply destruction. Absolutely. This resolves itself one of two ways, through general economic growth, which will increase demand, or through the supply destruction. And in that regard, this is very similar to the, to the year 2000. What was unique about 2000 is that the incipient gold bull market in terms other than the US dollar coincided with the resolution <laughs> of supply destruction. Right, and that's why you always say the best cure for low prices is low prices. That's um, right. But what happens when copper mines are just not shutting down because they're still profitable at these prices? It just means it's going to still be a few more years? Well, it's important to note that the description of copper mines as profitable in these prices involves very fancy accounting. The industry has this fraud called all-in sustaining capital costs, okay. where they suggest that they include mining costs, depletion, depreciation, and general administration head office expense. What they neglect to mention is that it doesn't include the $120 billion in ill-fated acquisitions that they've already written off. So the depreciation schedules that they're using to claim that they're profitable neglect to mm -hmm mention the $120 billion in shareholders' funds that they wasted last decade. So the, the projects that claim to be profitable at $1,100 gold or claim to be profitable at $2.20 copper 
involve them conveniently forgetting all of the shareholders' money that they wasted in the last decade. Right. Um, well, now, I was watching your presentation with um, Robert Friedland yesterday, and, uh, or the day before, and he had some, some interesting comments about China and the stock market and intervention and how um, every other part of the world has been you know, competitively devaluating their, their currencies except for China. So he seemed to allude that there were a lot of you know, arrows still in, in their quiver. Um, do you think we're going to see more and more intervention there in the coming months? Robert knows more about China than I. Robert has a house in Beijing. And my knowledge of, client, of China comes from watching the actions of my clients who are Chinese. Right. I wouldn't propose to second guess Robert. The point that he makes that makes some sense to me is that the Chinese are alleged to have about $4 trillion in foreign reserves. Mm. And that the individual savings of Chinese are, are very stout. So one would suggest that that society is more solvent than right. U.S. society is. In that sense, given that it's a command economy and the government seems to be able to mobilize the resources of the people, irrespective of their intentions, one would suggest that perhaps Robert's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, at this show, you have a lot of great companies here. I think you've said before, it doesn't really matter that the gold price is what it is. It's more just about good management teams that you know, know what they're doing. So. Um, do you think we're going to be seeing that M&A taking off now, or is it still going to be a few years? Yeah, you're just starting to see it take off now, and you're seeing it take, t take off in two ways. You're seeing third-tier companies where people held on to preserve their salaries, recognizing that they're not going to get salaries anyway, so they have nothing to lose by allowing <laughs> M&A. At the same time, you're seeing major and intermediate-tier companies that have scaled back their exploration so far that they're in liquidation. And if a good project comes up, they have to buy it, or else they're not going to have salaries in three years. One of the things that you're starting to see is you're starting to see a market that is in fact responding to drill holes again. Uh, you are seeing good holes getting rewarded because people understand that there is a huge dearth of good projects in the world. And we're coming into a period two years from now, say, where there's going to be a huge need for these good projects because the existing projects don't make money at existing prices. So are you more bullish then on resources or on oil or commodities such as precious metals or, or oil? In the very near term, I'm much more bullish about precious metals. The only thing that has to happen for the precious metals trade to work is that people become need to become a little less optimistic about the U.S. dollar. I've mm -hmm. never been one of these sort of gold bug guys who believe in the collapse of Western civilization. But I would point out to you that uh, at the top of gold's affection, uh, Morgan Stanley estimated, I believe it was Morgan Stanley, that 8% of investable assets in the United States were in precious metals and precious metal securities in 1980. The comparable figure today is one-third of 1%. The arithmetic median and mean over the last three decades has been 1.5%. If we got gold's market share of the American savings matrix back to two-thirds of the 30-year median or mean, we would triple demand for gold and gold-related assets in the largest savings economy in the world. That's what I think will happen. Gold won't win the war against the U.S. dollar, but it might lose it less badly. And if it lost it less badly, remember that gold didn't win the war against the U.S. dollar in the period 2000 to 2010. It still lost the war against the U.S. dollar, but it rose from $250 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. Right. Plenty for a guy like me. <laughs> now. Since you're so bullish, I guess, on precious metals, um, are most of the companies that you guys have here gold and silver companies? We have an interesting cross-section of companies. We have companies like Reservoir Minerals and um, Mariana mm -hmm. that have made what look to be very high quality copper discoveries. Mm -hmm. We aren't necessarily bullish on the copper business in the near term, but we're very bullish on world-class discoveries. Right. We had Robert Friedland here, um, the most successful mining promoter of his epoch. We are always bullish on high quality people, irrespective of the market and the commodity. Mm -hmm. It happens to be that Robert Friedland is um, developing a very high quality platinum asset, and I'm very bullish on platinum and palladium. But that's almost a coincidence. What I'm really bullish on is somebody like Robert Friedland, who has generated billions of dollars of wealth over 30 years with his own mm -hmm. efforts. Absolutely. Now, what should an investor at a show like this ask a CEO? Uh, the most important question to ask a CEO 
is what is it about your background that qualifies you for the task at hand? Mm. The CEO may say that he or she has been successful in mining, but what aspect of mining? Mm. If they were successful operating a gold mine in Archean terrain in French-speaking Quebec and they're looking for copper in tertiary volcanic rocks, young volcanic rocks in Spanish-speaking Peru, mm -hmm. it's as though you hired a very good electrician to do your plumbing. Uh, so the most important thing is the immediacy of the task at hand. Evidence of success, prior success, in an endeavor that's specifically related to the endeavor that you're embarked on today. Right, that's the what's same critical. skill set. And that's right. How about how ownership? You absolutely want to do business with partners. If you look at the person's compensation, it's all salary if they don't own any stock, why would they work hard to make you rich if they're not going to get rich themselves? Why wouldn't they try to save themselves for solvency and just make sure they got paid for five years as opposed to making you money. Absolutely. Very good point. Um, now just as we wrap up, Rick, what's your outlook for 2015? More of the same, I think. Um, I think it's going to be a very good year for me. I think it's going to be a good stock picker's year. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure it's going to be good for the market. We have to go through a lot of consolidation. We have to go through a lot of turmoil, particularly inside Sprott. Mm -hmm. uh, our lending business is the best it's been in 30 years in my experience. The other thing that makes me a little bit bullish about my own outlook is that our ability to complete private placements has been very poor for the last three years. Mm -hmm. The industry has needed capital, but the issuers were unwilling to price the equity issuances at prices that reflected the market conditions. My suspicion now is that the need has become dire enough that the executives who run these companies are going to become rational. I tried to say to the exhibitors this morning, I can go longer without writing checks than you guys came without cashing them. Let's not play chicken. Right, absolutely. And are you still holding as much cash? Yes, we are. Holding cash has not been a strategy. Mm. It's been a function of the fact that we can't find transactions that right. are priced in ways that we think are attractive to our investor base. Well, holding cash in U.S. dollars can't, couldn't have been a bad thing for you It was guys. a good mistake, yeah. but it was truly right. a mistake. We have not held cash as a strategy. Uh, the Sprout organization was built by taking large risks and getting extraordinary returns. We never purported to be people who were good at running money market funds. Okay. The fact that we have very high cash balances is really a function of the fact that the issuers have been, in our opinion, delusional mm. about what should be their appropriate cost of capital. Right. And just you're just waiting for them to accept the terms that Correct. you think make the most sense. Correct. I mean, the message for your viewers that are issuers is Sprott is open for business. When junior, when junior capital markets appear shut, Sprott is not. Right. But when you approach us, you have to be rational. We have made money for three decades by backing the best management teams across their balance sheets in good times or bad, but you got to meet us halfway. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us again today, Eric. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for researching the questions that you ask before you ask them of me.